Hello everyone, I'm Professor Plink. I respond to various theological and ideological questions and claims from a rationalistic and naturalistic approach in an effort to give and explain the opposite viewpoint and help to balance the conversation. Let's start off giving a whole lot of love to some recent super thankers. Avid Professor Plink Enjoyer, Jeff Petrimule X6806, James LaMica, Silverscope 13X, Design Tech DK, and Piao Octonawa. Thank you all very much for your kind support of my channel. You are the counter-apologetic, comfy, cozy clothing right out of the dryer, helping stave off the shivers and icy shards of religious snowflakes. Thank you very much for helping me to continue to do what I do. And if you like what you see in this video and would like to help out the channel, make sure to subscribe and click the bell so you'll always be notified when new content comes out. And of course, like the video, maybe pop in a comment. All that goes a long way towards pleasing the YouTube algorithm, be he ever joyful and triumphant, and keeping my channel motoring along. Now on to today's video. Well, dear friends, another new semester is upon us, and what has two thumbs and is back in the classroom in front of an array of students, all wishing desperately that they hadn't signed up for early morning classes? It's this guy. And as someone in the field of higher education, I have a fair amount of reverence for the importance of the responsibility of teaching young minds how to absorb and assimilate data. How to be on the lookout for fallacious reasoning and illogical argumentation. Giving them the tools that they need in order to be competent thinkers and open-minded explorers of the world around them. It is not at all about telling them what to think. It's not even condescendingly teaching them how to think. It's about equipping them with the best methods to sift through all of the various idea pushers who just want to coerce them to their way of thinking and allow them to come to their own conclusions based on the most sound reasoning possible and how to suss out what that reasoning is. And so, I often take special umbrage when some of those idea pushers, usually from far-right evangelism, insist that colleges are merely indoctrination centers run by heathens for the express purpose of turning your precious children away from the light and truth of their Lord Jesus Christ and propagandizing them straight into the fires of hell through the swamps of horrid atheism. Oh, won't somebody please think of the children? Think of the children. Won't somebody please think of the children? No, stop. Think of the children. So today, we're going to look at a nifty little piece of anti-education propaganda from a site called loveinvasion.org. They've thrown together a neat little short film to show just how the awful atheist educators will attempt to brainwash your delicate little flowers. I haven't watched it yet, but I know I'm going to have a lot of thoughts about this one. So let's dive in and see what they think about the current state of academia. to start out every school year. Guess what? There actually is going to be some dialogue in this thing. Seriously, was all of that preamble b-roll really necessary? Did we really need over a minute of establishing shots of the outside of the school, inside the school hallways, some of the kids walking into class, saying hi to each other, sitting down, opening their books? Honestly, couldn't we have just done one three-second overhead shot of the classroom with all the students already in it, and then the teacher begins talking? I mean, let's go. We are all literally coming closer to death with each passing second. Did we really need to waste precious minutes of our finite lives on that opening? But now, to the actual meat of the video. By coming and standing face-to-face -face with the Christian worldview, 
So at any time, if you feel like this class or this lecture is not for you, then please feel free to excuse yourselves. Wow, no good morning students? No, hi, my name is Miss So-and-so? No, welcome to whatever class this is? If for nothing else, just to make sure that everyone is in the right room and students haven't mistaken this class for something else. Just, ahem, fuck Christians specifically, and if you don't like it, you can get out. What a welcoming way to foster a nurturing learning environment. Here's the declaration I would like to make. God is an illusion. The plan of salvation is a delusion. And Christianity, if you will, in my opinion, is lethally dangerous nonsense. Science is our greatest body of knowledge. And its logic shows us with absolute clarity that belief in the Bible and its foundation of faith in Jesus is merely a person convincing himself to believe in something that does not exist. What the hell class even is this? Again, it would have been a little helpful had she begun by announcing the class and its focus and curriculum. But I mean, is this supposed to be a comparative theology slash mythology class? One might think so if her central focus is on dispelling religious mythology. But then, if that's the case, why did she focus on Christianity specifically? As if Muslims don't exist, as if Jews don't exist, as if Hindus don't exist, etc. That's how you know that this was made by Christians with no one secular involved in even so much as being the camera operator or a dolly grip. It's all the great Christian persecution complex that, one, insists that they are the most oppressed religious group in modern society, while simultaneously, two, ignoring the very existence of any other religious group. Or is this supposed to be some kind of a science class? One might think that, given that she touts science as paramount in reaching understanding and reason. There would simply be no reason to do that in a mythology or philosophy class. But if that's the case, then religion shouldn't even be brought up in the class at all. If your aim is to teach science, then teach science. The idea of the Christian worldview shouldn't even enter the discussion from the teacher's side of things. And if students ask about how science can comport with their religious beliefs, then the professor should answer with the utmost respect for their beliefs, even if they don't share them. For shit's sake, religious groups are a federally protected class. And part of any basic training for college professors includes instructions on how to handle students with beliefs that are in conflict with the course material. And none of it is to tell them to not let the door hit them where their fabled good lord split them. If this is how this instructor starts off her classes every semester, there is no way she wouldn't have been sued for discrimination by now. I mean, what is this class? Shitting on Jesus 101? As an aside, if I, an ardent atheist, were a student in this class and she had started off with that opening, I would have been like some of these students and walked out too. Because this is not what professors do, and not how we conduct ourselves in a classroom. Christian, this is your reality exposed. <laughs> reality? No. Rather, Jesus is the most popular imaginary friend in all of human history. Also, she's just stating her opinion on the matter. She even said that a little earlier. Christianity, if you will, in my opinion, is lethally dangerous nonsense. It doesn't matter what you think! <laughs> a professor isn't there to spew their opinions at the students. A professor is there to explain and help the students understand the class and the course material. I doubt very highly this class has a textbook that says Jesus is a, the world's most popular imaginary friend. So, just like we saw in the great Christian fantasy classic, God's Not Dead, Christians continue to think that colleges and universities are just places where uppity academic elites just stand at the front of the class and propagandize to the students as if they were Alex Jones just ranting their personal opinions and theories to a captive audience of students. Students who in most cases have to sit there and take it because they're dependent on that class and a good grade in it for their major. This woman should not be in charge of a class. 
Hell, she shouldn't even be in charge of a petting zoo, even if there were 12 accomplished zoologists supervising her. And I say that more or less in total agreement with everything that she's said thus far. But this is neither the time nor the place for her opinions on theism. Even if it is a comparative theology course, it certainly isn't a Christians are dumb, throw rocks at them course. If Jesus isn't real, then how could so many people be wrong? Oh, shit. And I was on your side, young lady. Don't make me backtrack on that. Uh, so we have appeal to popularity. Using the popularity of a premise or proposition as evidence for its truthfulness. This is a fallacy which is very difficult to spot because our common sense tells us that if something is popular, it must be good, true, or valid. But this is not so. Especially in a society where clever marketing social and political weight, and money can buy popularity. How could so many people be wrong? How can you honestly make that argument and not see the holes in it big enough to drive a truck through? If Zeus and Poseidon aren't real, how could so many ancient Greeks have been wrong? If slavery is unethical and immoral, how could so many historic slave-owning cultures and people be wrong? I mean, this is some of the most vapid nonsense. Of course large groups of like-minded people can be wrong. And the popularity of a viewpoint, belief, or action has no bearing on whether or not it's true, good, or useful. I mean, if everyone jumped off a bridge, would you jump off too? There was once a time when everyone believed that the world was flat. And there was probably a time, darling, when even you believed in Santa Claus. What changed that? Evolution of thinking and the truth. Okay, while she did basically say the same thing that I did, again, as this young woman's teacher, she should not have delivered it in such a bitchy manner, and should not have argued against this young lady's faith in open class like that. That student has a serious complaint case of discrimination that she should be heading to the dean of the department to file. Do you have something to say? Professor, what I'm about to say, I mean in the most sincere way possible. You're an atheist, correct? Yes, I am. Well then, I don't really understand your lecture. What I do understand is you as an atheist, and everyone else in this room, is searching for God, even without knowing it. Well, for starters, she hasn't given any lecture. She's berated the beliefs of Christians specifically, and stated her opinion, as though it mattered at all in a class and curriculum. But I take exception to the idea that everyone, atheists included, are searching for God. Plenty of people have no use for the idea of God, and would prefer if they could avoid it entirely for the rest of their lives. Plenty more people believe that they have found God and aren't searching anymore, but are just trying to live God's will. And though that might be something that they have to contend with every day of their lives, their search is, as far as they are concerned, over. But even those of us who are agnostic atheists and are open to the possibility that some kind of God being could exist, well, I can really only speak for myself, but I'm not searching for God. I don't believe such a being exists. So there's nothing to search for. But if presented with sufficient evidence to change my stance and warrant a belief in such a being, that is what I would do. But I don't see it happening. And so I'm certainly not searching for a being I believe to be a fiction. It's rather condescending to claim that atheists are searching for God without knowing it. It's akin to the old apologist trope that everyone believes in God, they just suppress the truth in their unrighteousness. If that isn't true and God doesn't exist, then my question to you would be, who are we arguing about? Because if you were to say God, then it would defeat the purpose of your lecture. No, oh, back it up, back it up. Beep, beep, beep. <laughs> whoa, whoa, what the hell was that? He's not going to explain that statement? Because it really needed some explaining. I'm going to repeat what he just said for clarity said, atheists are looking for God without knowing it. If that isn't true, and God doesn't exist, then who are we arguing about? Because if you were to say God, 
then that would defeat the purpose of your lecture. That is exactly what he just said. How does God not existing defeat the purpose of lecturing about God not existing? Is this that thing that Christians sometimes say that if you're arguing against the existence of something, then it must exist in order for you to argue against it? The fact that you're against something is actually evidence that it exists. That isn't how anything works. Do you believe in universe-belching unicorns from the 8th dimension, burping our cosmos into existence? No? Well, the fact that you're against that idea is actually proof that the unicorns do exist. This is nonsense. And even that one student was flabbergasted at the stupidity of that argument. I believe Christians have been deceived. God is a delusion. And as a result, Jesus has become the world's most popular imaginary friend. Professor, whether you believe in the Bible or not, Jesus is not the world's most popular imaginary friend. History itself proves that Jesus Christ is the most influential person to ever walk the face of this earth. Well, that's certainly a debatable claim. I mean, even within your own Christian mythology, I might say Paul was more influential, since he was the one who really wrote down a lot of the Bible and was responsible for the early spread of the Christian faith. The fact that he wasn't the central figure of it like Jesus was doesn't mean that he wasn't instrumental in its propagation through its early days. But of course, Muslims would say Muhammad was the most influential. One could argue other figures from history like King Hammurabi, Gautama Buddha, Aristotle, or Leonardo da Vinci are arguably more influential to modern society depending on what metrics you're looking at. But all that aside, that statement about Jesus being real misses the point. Aside from the fact that there are mythicists who aren't even convinced a person called Jesus of Nazareth actually existed, the professor in this video was alluding to the Christian belief that Jesus rose from the dead, is seated at the right hand of the Father, i.e. God, and hears prayers of Christians, and is alive in spirit and power in the world today. So, announcing that Jesus was an influential historical figure does nothing to dispel her claim of him being an imaginary friend for those who believe that he's still around. Influential, yes, but if he is the Son of God, and if God is love, like all you Christians claim that he is, then why is there so much evil in the world? I don't think that question disproves God's existence more than it actually proves it. Well, you're wrong. Because if you say that there is evil, then I assume you believe there is good, correct? Right. And if there is good and evil, then there must be a moral law, the basis on which you can differentiate the two. No. One does not need an objective moral law in order to classify things as good or evil. Because one can subjectively classify things as good or evil. And common standards of right and wrong, good and bad, exist in every society and culture. They're called ethics. Since we have common ethics that are co-constructed and then culturally applied and reinforced, we can have a variety of beliefs about right and wrong that were created through subjective interpretations but are applied more or less objectively. Like, for instance, through the application of laws. It is unambiguous law that you can't walk up to someone on the street and punch them in the face. No matter who you are, you can't do that. That law is objectively applied to all people. But its conception was still subjective, as plenty of people and plenty of cultures throughout history have made allowances for situations where striking someone may be allowable. Like, for instance, Christianity, where the Bible allows for the brutal beating of people so long as they were your slaves and so long as they didn't die for a couple of days from the beating. So, we culturally evolved our ethics based on our subjective assessments of right and wrong, and then set our societal laws in accordance with those ethics. There's no need for any kind of objective moral law in order to reach this state of affairs. Sure. What? No! You dimwit! You just shot yourself in the foot! Why are you ceding a crucial part of his argument to him when there's no basis for it? Oh, that, that's right, because this script was written by Christians, and Christians can't fathom the idea of not believing in objective moral law existing absent of human creation of it. 
And if there is a moral law, then there must be a moral law giver. Well, then it's a good thing there isn't moral law. And if there's no moral law, then there's no moral law giver. But this is the person that you're trying to disprove. So if there is no moral law giver, there can be no moral law. If there is no moral law, there is no good. If there's no good, there's no evil. Nope. That is where you went off the rails. Even without moral law, there can absolutely still be good and evil. Say it with me now. Subjective good and evil. How can you be so certain that there is a God? There is no absolute truth. Are you sure? Yes. Are you absolutely sure? Because if you were to say yes, that would be self-defeating. How can you say there is no absolute truth and yet at the same time be absolutely sure? You stole that directly from Frank Turek. When somebody says there is no truth, you ought to ask that person a question. You ought to say, is that true? Is it true that there's no truth? Because if it's true that there's no truth, the claim there is no truth can't be true, but it claims to be true. It was a dumb thing for him to say, and it's a dumb thing for you to say. Uncertainty is the only certainty there is, and knowing how to live with insecurity is the only security. John Allen Paulos. Basically, admitting that we, as humans, do not have access to unabridged truth, we don't have access to certain, completely accurate assessments of reality, is not a self-defeating idea. I mean, everything we ever experience, think, and feel, it all runs into the philosophical problem of hard solipsism. This is the idea that only one's mind is sure to exist. Solipsists contend that knowledge of anything outside of one's own mind is unsure, hence there's no such thing as an objective truth, and nothing about the external world and its workings can actually be known. We have no way to know whether or not the things we experience are things that actually exist in reality, and not hallucinations in our brain, that we're not a brain in a vat, that we're not plugged into the matrix, that we're not computer-generated characters in a super-advanced computer system. And acknowledging that it is a possibility that nothing you experience is real, and therefore you can't be sure that anything is true, does not defeat itself simply because, derp, you can't be sure that uncertainty is true. No, uncertainty is the only certainty. It's the exception that proves the rule. Actually, I think what he means is this. Not one person can have all the knowledge. Not one religion can have all the truth. By saying that, do you realize you are claiming the very knowledge that you say no one can have? No, you're not. One does not need to have all knowledge to understand that no one can have all knowledge. I don't need to know everything to know that you also don't know everything. I mean, all it would take is knowing one thing that someone else, or in this case, a belief system, doesn't know, to disprove the idea that that belief system knows everything. Like, say, evolution, for instance. That is something the founders of the Judeo-Christian view of life didn't know about. And so, their creation story is wrong. So they clearly did not have all knowledge, and their belief system does not have all knowledge. And what do they do in the face of that reality? Just deny, deny, deny insist that all the mountains of scientific evidence that show evolution as about the most rigorously verified scientific theory out there, that it's all in fact wrong, and Adam and Eve and the Garden of Eden is correct. And that is just one thing in a myriad of blunders, cock-ups, and dumb fuckery that we can attribute to the Christian faith. I don't need to know everything to know that the Christian faith knows very, very little. Everything in this world is meaningless. You don't mean that. Yes, yes I do. I'm assuming what you're saying is meaningful. So how can everything be meaningless? If everything in life is meaningless, then what you just said means nothing. So what? If that student happens to be a nihilist, then what he just said did mean nothing as far as he was concerned. That doesn't mean that it isn't true. Seeing as meaning is derived, that means it's up to the individual to imbue, well, pretty much anything with meaning. That means that meaning is, much like morality, subjective. Only on a much more individualistic scale than morality tends to be. So, for this guy, this conversation is, ultimately, meaningless. 
But that doesn't mean that he shouldn't want to engage in it or engage in any number of other things that he might consider ultimately meaningless. Because they are, to him, meaningless. Also, the question of meaningless in what sense seems to be left off the table here. He might mean that everything is cosmically meaningless. That is to say, our planet is like a grain of sand on a massive beach that is our cosmos. And nothing that happens on this particular little dust mite of a planet is going to impact the wider universe in any measurable way. This planet could blow up tomorrow, and the galaxy would go right on spinning, the universe would go right on expanding, and the vast majority of that universe will be utterly unaffected by our planet popping its cork. Cosmically meaningless. And that's for the whole planet. The lives and actions of any one person on this little planet? Even smaller, even less impactful, cosmically meaningless. But none of that means that this guy's life, experiences, or conversations like this one aren't, to some degree, meaningful to him. Or to all of us, collectively, as a society. Because one person's life and actions can certainly have societal impact and meaning. So what kind of meaning are we talking about? That's an important distinction that you breeze right past in order to throw a gotcha in this guy's face. You all do realize that it actually takes more faith to not believe in God than it does to believe in him. Are we just reading directly out of Frank Turk's book now? Seriously, did Frank write this entire script? How so? Well, who created the stars? Now you see, wouldn't it just be easier to say God? And when did you stop beating your wife? Oh, that's a loaded question, improperly formed in order to insist upon an answer that isn't necessarily true? You're right, it is. No one created the stars, and the stars did not require a creator. They formed through natural processes with no intentionality behind any of it. And that is a much easier thing than saying God did it. Because that's generally used as a catch-all answer for things you are not just ignorant of, but willfully ignorant of. You don't want to know how things like star formations happened, because that might threaten your God belief. Also, just as an aside, the professor has completely lost control of the class for the last several minutes now. What, is she just sitting up at the front of the room, letting this theistic discussion roll on without her even being involved anymore? Everything in existence is a cause of evolution or evolving. If not, how do you explain so many different types of races, nationalities, languages, and colors? Well, no, not everything in existence. Evolution is about how life diversified. Most things in existence, like stars, planets, nebulas, galaxies, rocks, oceans, dirt, atoms, the periodic table of elements, yeah, none of that stuff came about by evolution. But sure, if you want to switch gears of the conversation to the diversification of life, then sure, we can go to evolution. I think you're asking the wrong question, because what you're implying is that there are things within this universe that simply evolved from nothing, that they just came into existence. No, he isn't. He specifically said races, nationalities, languages, and colors. None of those things came into existence out of nothing. All of those things, assuming he meant skin color and not just color in general, came about through human genetic and cultural evolution. And humans came about by evolving from our hominid ancestors. So we didn't come into existence out of nothing but instead changed from an earlier life form, as all creatures alive on this planet today have done. So, you guys are jumping around so much, you aren't staying on a single topic for more than one sentence. This guy tried to switch from epistemology and philosophical ideas of meaning to a discussion on evolution, and then in response, the Christian attempts to shift to creation ex nihilo which is a common Christian idea, mind you, and then insists that it's a nonsense notion because nothing can come from nothing. Even though, as a Christian, he literally believes that the universe came from nothing. That it was literally spoken into existence out of nothing. It's always so weird when Christians try to flip this and insist that atheists, who posit evolution as a process of living things coming from prior living things, actually believe that everything came from nothing. Meanwhile, they, the Christians, who believe that everything came from nothing, are the ones arguing against that silly notion. That's like saying, this pencil, 
simply came into existence, which we all know is not true. There had to be something outside of this pencil in order for it to be created. The pencil cannot in and of itself explain its own origin. Prior to the pencil, we must conclude that there was a mind to think of it and that there were hands to create it. It didn't just evolve or come into existence. Logically, the question then becomes not how did we get so many different types of pencils, shapes, sizes, and colors, but who created the pencil to begin with? One of these things is not like the other. One of these things just doesn't belong. Can you tell which one is not like the other by the time I finish this song? That's right. One of these objects, the pencil, is man-made. As such, it must be created with intentionality by humans. The others, the Grand Canyon, the ocean, the planet itself, these are natural formations. They form through natural processes, with no intentionality behind them at all. So you can't point to something man-made, like a pencil, and say since it had to have a maker, then natural formations, like practically everything in the universe, also must have a maker. Honestly, I don't want to have to talk down to him in such a manner, but, I mean, screw it, I'm not his professor. I have no obligation to be respectful of his terrible arguments. That's good. So, you're saying that everything has to have a reason for existence. Someone created the pencil, someone created the fish, someone created the universe, right? Yes, ma'am. Great. Then tell me, who created God? Oh, she is still in the classroom. I figured she'd gone down to the teacher's lounge to get a stiff drink and read a blog on how to best berate and demoralize your students from the Mrs. Trunchbull School of Thought on Education. But it is a nice retort. It addresses the special pleading that Christians tend to do, insisting that everything has to have a creator, including the universe itself. So then, if this is a hard and fast rule of existence, that everything that exists has to owe its existence to something outside of itself, then why doesn't this rule apply to their God being? So let's see how they dodge, I, I mean answer, this query. There is no argument there. If God were a being, then it would need an explanation. The column cosmological argument is whatever begins must have a cause. Because anything that comes into being must have a cause for its being. God is eternal and is not a being. And if God is not a being, then he doesn't need a cause. So, semantic word salad. Of course the Christian conception of God is a being. Shall we see what constitutes a being? Well, like most words, being has multiple usages. Let's see how many of them apply to the Christian idea of God. Okay, the quality or state of having existence. Well, Christians believe God has existence, so yep, that's one. Something that is conceivable and hence capable of existing. Well, yeah, Christians can certainly conceive of their God, so that's two. Something that actually exists. Again, Christians believe their God exists, so that's three. The totality of existing things. Well, the Christian idea is that God is omnipresent. Everywhere in the whole universe simultaneously. That God, in effect, is the whole universe. So, yep, that's four. Conscious existence. Do Christians think God is a conscious, existing thing? Yep, that's five. The qualities that constitute an existing being. Again, yep, they think he is an existing being. So that's six. A living thing. Well, Matthew 16.16 16 says, Simon Peter answered, You are the Messiah, the Son of the living God. Christians often refer to their God as the living God. So, yep, living, that's seven. The Christian conception of God meets every part of the definition of a being. To claim that he isn't a being, in order to play some rhetorical game using the horribly fallacious Kalam cosmological argument, and trying to use that in order to say, God didn't come into being, hence he isn't a being, hence he's not subject to that hard and fast rule that everything that exists needs a creator, well, that's bullshit, pal. Total bullshit. The greater question is not who created God, it is can eternity exist? 
And since you and I can't be absolutely sure, the only logical conclusion would be that eternity, at least, is possible. If eternity is possible, then the primordial form of the universe, the hot, dense state that the Big Bang expanded out of, could have existed itself for that eternity. And if that is at least possible, then by your own standards and arguments, the universe would be exempt from the rule of needing a creator. And since the universe didn't need a creator, there's no justifiable reason to posit a creator god, other than that you want there to be one. And certainly no reason to hitch your wagon to the Christian god, who wants you to stone your unruly children to death, own slaves, and dash babies against rocks. Most people choose not to believe in the Christian faith, not because it was attempted and proven false, but rather because it was found convicting and never tried. I will agree with that. The majority of non-Christians are non-Christians because they've never been Christians. They were raised in other faiths. Muslims, Buddhists, Jainists, Taoists, Jewish, Neo-Pagan, etc. And most people tend to remain in the religion that they were raised in. But that is a sword that cuts both ways, my friend. Most Christians aren't Christians because they've tried other religions and found them wanting. They're Christians because they were born into it, indoctrinated into its belief system, and raised to fear the spiritual danger they could be in if they ever sincerely doubted or questioned that faith. Be real, sir. You're a Christian because you were born into it. Not because you have honestly tested it against other belief systems, both religious and secular, and sincerely found it to be the best. Christians believe in God, not because we believe him to be true, but also because of his unsearchable riches. I mean, think about it. Truth exceeds even the desires of the wisest men. That was pure word salad. Christians believe in God because it's unsearchable riches, which are then never explained what he means by that, and then says, truth exceeds even the desires of the wisest men? This is some real Yoda shit here. In that, it sounds deep, but it doesn't really mean anything. Train yourself to let go of everything you fear to lose. If the riches are unsearchable, then they are unfindable, unattainable, and therefore a fool's errand. Truth exceeds the desires of the wisest? Well, what if a greater understanding of truth is what you desire? And what if that truth is that there is no God? Examine yourselves. Reevaluate your belief systems. You just might see that the more someone tries to disprove facts, the more that it proves them true. The lack of self-awareness here is absolutely beautiful. Because this is exactly what I would say to him. Examine yourself. Reevaluate your Christian belief system. Or maybe honestly evaluate it for the first time in your life, rather than just blindly following and parroting back the nonsense that you've heard from William Lane Craig or Frank Turek. You just might see that the more Christians try to disprove facts, like the 4.5 billion year age of the Earth, or evolution, or star formation being a natural process, the more that it proves them true. The truth is, if there was no God, there would be no atheists. Just as, if there were no objections, there would be no protesters. That's another banger of a stupid Christian argument. The existence of the central figure of a belief system is not a necessary component of that belief system being massively influential. Say enough people believed in Bigfoot that it became a real social and political force, with the power to legislate behavior and enforce their cultural norms around what they believe Bigfoot wanted from them. They forced everyone to eat raw fish from the river and poop down their legs as they walked along in the woods and a bunch of other stuff that their primate benefactor wants everyone to do. Then, in response, a contingent of a-Bigfootists banded together to say they didn't believe in Bigfoot and didn't want to live by these imposed rules from the Church of the Holy Simeons. Now, does the existence of people who don't believe in Bigfoot, who exists in opposition to those who insist that he does exist, automatically mean that Bigfoot exists... Or does it just mean that a lot of uppity yahoos who want to control everyone else is imposing their simianic beliefs on people who don't want them? You don't get to shove a fictional character down the throats of people who don't want it 
and then declare that by them objecting to what you are doing proves that the fictional character isn't fiction at all. Okay, that'll be all. Class dismissed. Class is dismissed? It's been five freaking minutes! I mean, I know it's been a lot longer for us because I do tend to drone on for quite a bit, but in the context of this video, it has been just a little over five minutes since she started the class. A class she never passed out any syllabus for, she never discussed what the semester workload or projects will be like, a class that has in no way oriented the students towards what they can expect the semester to cover or how class periods are expected to play out. She just balked at and ran off some of the Christians in the class, let the remaining ones argue with the non-Christians for a few minutes, and then said, let's bounce. First day of class is over, and we still have no idea what this class is even supposed to be. But that is all we get from this video. And it didn't disappoint. Well, I mean, it absolutely did disappoint in that it was a horrid example of any kind of higher education, but it is exactly what I expected it to be. A shoddily thrown together Christian take on how horrible professors are and colleges in general. How persecuted the Christians are in modern academia. And a hefty amount of some of the worst Christian arguments thrown around, left unchallenged, because Christians generally can't conceive of how anyone could possibly argue against their totally bulletproof reasoning. And then schooling, no pun intended, all the horrible atheists in the room. We had appearances from the Kalam cosmological argument, the contingency argument, the teleological argument, special pleading for their god, and some rhetorical flotsam meant to sound smarter than it was. The reality is that everyone in this situation sucked. I can't really hold it against the Christians for defending their faith, but it never should have come up and come under attack in the first place. And if this is supposed to be a philosophy class where different religious beliefs are being discussed or even challenged, then those awful Christian arguments should have been challenged as well. But again, as a Christian script and production, the makers of this video would never let something as terrible as actual objections to these lines of thinking come up. So yeah, anyway, I'm offended by how terrible this was. I'm offended as an atheist when these chronically bad arguments are continually presented time and time again, generation after generation, passed from pastor to parishioner, and then puked up to every passerby. I'm offended as a professor when these spurious depictions of atheist instructors are constantly tossed around. I mean, I've been teaching for over 15 years, and I guarantee you, not a single student I've ever had knows that I'm an atheist. Well, unless any of them have found my channel, because it's not something I bring into the classroom. It has no place there. And I'm offended as a communication specialist, as this debate, if you can even call it that, was laden with fallacies and was so biasly one-sided that it hurt my brain to watch it. But thankfully, it's over now. So I'm going to go wash my mind out with old Quantum Leap reruns and hard liquor. And so that is where we'll end things for today. So thanks for watching, everyone. Don't forget to like this video, comment, and subscribe so you'll always be notified when a new video comes out. Until next time, I'm Professor Plink reminding you to keep striving for greater understanding. It's the best way to get wherever you want to go.